Welcome to pre-med office hours episode. I have no clue. 144, apparently. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, welcome. We are the Medical School HQ Advising Team. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray. I'm joined by my mapped co-founder, Rachel Grubbs, who has 20 plus years of MCAT and pre-med advising experience. Indeed, How are you I doing, do. Rachel? I'm good. I was just telling someone that when I started in MCAT and pre-med health, uh, pre-med advising, that uh, the MCAT was twice a year paper and pencil. You know, I mean, that's how I took it. um, With some of the changes that came out from AMCAS this week, I know we talked about some changes from ACOMAS a couple weeks ago. Like, it's always changing a little bit. Sometimes you get cataclysmic changes, but there's like two to five percent every year until it's almost a completely different beast than it used to be. So I'm here. I'm happy. I'm trying to keep up to date so I can help you all keep up to date with us. How we do it. Also joining us today is Courtney Lewis, former director of advising at Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine. You, uh, what was the, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, the like, not panel, the like board that you were voted to. Oh, so um, I held two elected positions on the council of admissions officers for osteopathic medical. Is there a secret handshake for the council? Oh no, we lost Courtney. That's funny, right no, there. We're just like coming to fit back. No, diversity <laughs> and stuff like that, but you know. The, the internet gods knew that she was going to tell a secret, and they're like, no, you cannot tell that secret. Focus on um, a handshake. Yes. Um, well, I'm excited. Uh, Rachel, you were talking about some AMCAS changes. Yeah. We finally, we've been talking about for a while. We we knew it was official, but it wasn't public yet. And we, we were talking about it anyway, um, about this change from the disadvantaged essay to this new other impactful experiences essay. The AAMC AMCAS has finally made that public. And what I like is that they actually gave us what the prompt will look like. So I'm going to share my screen here so that we can show everyone else what's going on. I think it is this one. Yes, it is. All right. So as we add this to the stream, I'll make this a bigger. Uh, Here's this new other impactful experiences. And the first reaction that I got from a lot of students was like, oh my gosh, that is terrible. They're removing this thing, this disadvantaged thing that I was going to mark myself as, and and they're taking it away. The the injustice. And I was like, take a breath. This is actually a good change because this opens it up to a lot of other students as well. We got questions all the time about, uh, can I mark myself disadvantaged? And, 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 is this thing that I've been through a disadvantage enough that I can mark it? And we'll probably still get some of that with this other impactful experiences. But um, you can see here, this is the prompt that they are going to provide you in AMCAS. So when AMCAS opens up here next month, here's what this new prompt will look like. And and it's really, right? This is, I, I called... Um, the disadvantaged essay for a long time, I called it the context essay. It Mm -hmm. lets advisors or reviewers, the admissions committees, get more context about your application so that when they're looking at your transcripts, they can go, oh, I remember what they said in the disadvantaged essay. That's where this dip in grades comes from. Or they're looking at your activities and seeing that your hours may not stack up against the rest of students, but they go, oh, I can see in your disadvantaged essay that, that you had this other stuff going on as well. And this is the same thing, right? This is just a modified disadvantaged essay. It removes the word disadvantage and then just says, hey, have you had impactful experiences? They may be disadvantageous experiences, um, but maybe not. They're just impactful experiences that you want to add context to your application. And so, Rachel, you had mentioned, we don't know how long the essay is going to be. And I assumed it was going to be the 1325 like they all are. And that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. So that's good as well. So initial thoughts when you saw this prompt? I thought it was good news too. Um, It's a little more um, specific than I thought it would be, right? Like uh, one of the things I had been telling students, and again, you know, we take educated guesses, but when I first heard about this, I'd actually forgotten that there was an other impactful experiences in ARIS and that 
that probably AMCAS would be mimicking the residency prompt. The way I was interpreting it is very similar to the Texas optional. So, and that one is very short. That prompt for the Texas optional essay, which is also essentially other impactful is, do you have other impactful experiences that you want to share? And then they really only clarify just can't be a continuation of personal statement or experiences has to be new information. So I had wondered if it would be sort of that general. Yeah. Um, where this is definitely still talking about challenges, yep. they're just sort of allowing for the fact that I think a lot of people interpret disadvantaged as financial only. I've long made the case that disadvantaged can be environmental. And I also think that you can recognize that overall you have a lot of privilege and are not a disadvantaged person or you don't want to you want to take that label of being disadvantaged because that just doesn't sit right with you, but that you still had something really major that maybe was a big challenge. So um, so yeah, it's a little different than I thought it was going to be, but overall, I still see this as a boon. Students only have the essays as a way to communicate their humanity. So here's one more way to do that. Yeah. 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 There was there was a big Reddit thing uh, that I chimed in on. A, a student who came from a very financially secure house, but her religion and her culture was that as a woman, she should not be pursuing higher education. And she was kicked out of her house at one point, uh, obviously kind of shunned and uh, probably talked down to all the time. Like, why are you doing this? You're 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 not supposed to be doing this. That's mm -hmm. not who we are. Like and and a lot of people on Reddit were like, no, that's not what the disadvantaged essay is for. And I'm like, baloney. <laughs> that's exactly what the disadvantaged essay is for. And I, again, I think just removing that word disadvantage, because as, as you said, Rachel, right, it has some financial connotations to it experiences doesn't ring a bell in terms of finances. So mm -hmm. hopefully this will allow more people to go, oh yes, this is me, I can write something here. So I'm excited. Me too. All right, let's get rocking and rolling. If you're watching on Instagram, go over to premed.tv. That is where we will answer questions. Um, and just a reminder, uh, unfortunately we have closed application Academy for the year. Um, if you're applying in 2024 to start medical school in 2025, we'll reopen application Academy for new enrollments later this year in 2023. Uh, but we still have some space for one-on-one -on -one advising. You can check out everything we do at medicalschoolhq.net. So with that plug out of the way, <laughs> David asks, Hey, mapped team. An English professor wants to write me a glowing letter of recommendation. He wants to know what medical schools look for in these letters. What should I tell him? Courtney, we have the wonderful AAMC LOR writer guidelines. There's always a lot of confusion of like, well, does that work if I'm applying to DO schools as well? It's some general information. What, what do you think is a good, good answer here? Yeah, I would refer the letter writer to kind of those, those, formatting pages that will give them a little bit of insight. It really breaks down the types of things that medical schools are going to want to see or what they can talk to that would give us some information that would be helpful. Really, we want to know a little bit about their interaction with you, what it was like, um, how strongly they would like to advocate for you, some evidence-based information on why that is. And, and that pretty much wraps it. But there are some formatting things and, and some call-outs that would be helpful if they, if they had links to those pages or that information. I think we also have something in my LORs that we just started. So um, we have some examples in there if you want. I know Ryan didn't bring that up, but I mean... If you wanted to use that, you could. Yep. Um, so David did chime in that he had shared that, but they were interested in more specific details or qualities. So, I mean, for sure, you're right. They should be genuine. Talk about what you've done or do. You can kind of think of your letter of Rex writers as like, this is your team. This is your hype team. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is going to be able to represent all of your good qualities, but who can speak to certain qualities, certain competencies. So that's where I think some of those, the AAMC guidelines are helpful because it outlines which competencies they're looking for. But also I personally, as someone who's written many letters, um, letters of rec for med school, you can't give me too much information. Well, maybe you could, but if you give me your mapped account, right? Give me read only access to that. And you give me a resume or a CV, you give me your LinkedIn profile and you give me the AAMC letter of rec guidelines. I don't have to use it all. 
But now if I need a refresher or a reminder on some context outside of the way I know you personally, I find that helpful. Um, I mean, I still think the letter should be deeply personal. I don't want it to just be a reiteration of your resume, right? But but it, I think it can be helpful just to make sure that your writer has, has all the right data on you. So I would advise providing that and they can do with it what they want. Yeah, and I think showing versus telling, which is something that we say very frequently, um, is always best, right? You don't want them to just make blanket statements this person is a lifelong learner. This person has integrity. Like give an example of an interaction mm -hmm. where I can glean that information out of it and it's not coming across as very canned, just kind of detached statements where I'm not getting a lot of background as to how somebody would know that about you. So when they can show and, and give it in a more organic way, I would encourage that. Yep, yep. Show not tell. Sticks a 98. <laughs> My dad taught me that Sticks is the greatest rock band of all time. What? What's that from? Come on. Oh, it's from Big Daddy. Uh, I started writing second. It's one of the best movies that Adam Sandler has ever done. Big Daddy. So, so good. Uh, I started writing secondaries about 10 in. Amazing. And I'm starting to feel like I'm repeating myself. Yep. Any tips on how I can vet my writing to distinguish between appropriate, unnecessary repetitiveness? We do have secondary essay feedback packages that you can uh, help use here. Um, but Rachel, secondaries do get repetitive. Right. Because there are multiple schools asking very similar questions. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking is like, first of all, again, super shout out. Love that you're pre-writing secondaries. Um, if you guys aren't aware, you can go to secondaryapps.com and see your repository of prior secondaries used in prior years. We are in the process of updating that now to make sure we've got all the latest ones from last year. Um, but typically uh, secondaries, they might change year to year. It can happen. Often they don't. So I typically recommend pre-writing. Um, just so that you're not overwhelmed by the sudden onslaught when they all arrive. So big kudos to you. Um, but then um, I guess what you have to worry about is, are you repetitive within the school or are you repetitive school to school? In which case it probably doesn't matter, right? So if you're using all the same stories in your secondary as in your primary, that makes me nervous, right? I would want you to either have fresh stories or at least a fresh angle on a story. But if school A asks about, um, um, you know, diversity and school B asks about diversity, and those are going to be slightly different questions, so it shouldn't be a copy paste. But if you've got an answer for each of them that is kind of similar, not only do I think that's okay if the question is similar, but like no one will know but you, right? Like school B is not reading school A's responses. So I'm just I, uh, not sure you've got a problem there, friend. Yeah. And tone and and tone. Uh, what qualifies as a leadership position for extracurricular activities? I'm a software and I'm not sure if being in a being a club president or a student tutor counts as leadership experience. I love you all. Oh, that's so mm -hmm. nice. Um, leadership. I mean, club president sounds pretty straightforward. Courtney, a lot of students like to put being a TA, being a tutor as leadership. And I'm just, I always go, mm, is that really leadership? Or we have a category for teaching, tutoring, TAing. Right. What do you think about being a tutor as a leadership? Um, I would probably agree with you on that. I think, you know, there are jobs and, and maybe that doesn't necessarily qualify, but there are things you can head a project, you can take on you know, in some of your volunteer efforts, maybe you're in charge of leading the social media efforts or gaining exhibitors or things like that or helping with funding. So there are ways within a role to take on a leadership type position or function for a little while that I think would be a little bit more conducive to fitting under that category. I also wanted to make a Big Daddy reference where I was going to say, no fair, you give Rachel all the easy ones. <laughs> hip, hip hop, hip, hip hop anonymous. <laughs> Apparently I need to watch this movie. That's so good, so good. I got a two, a five, a nine, a 10, I win. <laughs> Scuba Steve. 
I don't have anything against Adam Sandler. I'm just not deeply familiar with his work the way you two are. <laughs> but I wipe my own ass. <laughs> so okay. good. Uh, it's such a good and so I hope that helps. Yes, yeah, leadership is flexible. I think a lot of people think it has to be like a promotion or a title, and I disagree. Right? Yep. If you're club president, that sure sounds like leadership, but I don't think that's the only way. Yep. Anna Katharina, I've been told not to talk about my eating disorder recovery, etc., mm -hmm. because it could indicate mental health issues. Is this really a red flag for admissions committees? Um, that they would not consider me. Uh, Rachel, I had an episode come out recently on the pre-med years where I talked to a biology professor at Arizona State uh, who did some research with her team about talking about mental health on applications. They um, went to uh, admissions committee members at different medical schools and did a kind of a research project and found that, yeah, there's no statistically significant bias when it comes to talking about mental health in an application. Now, there are lots of problems with their study because it was really just like one line in the personal statement that mentioned, oh, the dip in my grades was because of mental health or it was because of something else. or yeah. and, and the grades ultimately were stellar anyway, so it really didn't raise any concerns. Mm -hmm. um, we have a general stance of like, if it's a part of your story, you're probably going to have to talk about it. What are, you, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, uh, Anna, two things. One is thanks for being brave and vulnerable. Two, I've told you before, but I love your name. I always think you're a Dutch princess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you're not. You're like a pre-med from Michigan or something. But yeah, awesome name. Good job, parents. Um, but uh, to me, what matters with sharing any kind of health issue, whether mental or physical, is one, you do not have to disclose. You get to choose if you want to. And two, I think if you're going to decide to disclose because it is part of your story or you think it's very relevant to the prompt of the essay, then make sure you leave us with confidence, right? I, I know I also struggle with mental health. I think a lot of us, people are more, people are more open about it now than they used to be, but it's, it's a common thing to have mental health issues. And my concern is whether or not, you, not whether or not you've had them, it's whether or not you've learned coping skills. So if someone asks you about your eating disorder and six times out of 10, you start crying, maybe it doesn't go in the essay because it might then show up in the interview. But if this is something that was years ago and yes, you have some bad days and some good days, but more good days than bad and you've got your coping skills and you know the warning signs to get yourself back on track when you're struggling and you can talk about it calmly and positively, then yeah, share it, dude. I mean, think how many patients are going to be grateful to have a physician who actually gets it, right? Like your life experiences shape who you are. Um, I think just the big thing is making sure it's relevant, right? The personal statement is why medicine. If your eating disorder is part of your why medicine, then it goes in there. Megana, if one is ORM, well, we'll talk about that, but first generation of college in the USA, would they be considered disadvantaged? So first of all, we don't have this term disadvantaged anymore, so we can stop using it. Second of all, there is no such thing as ORM. Courtney, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on this. I don't know if you know this kind of back and forth Um the, the AAMC many years ago did a did a kind of a big study. Um, I think it was uh, 3,000 by 2,000 was the the big name. Uh, and they defined an underrepresented minority oh, or yeah. underrepresented yep. in medicine. Mm -hmm. That definition has kind of gone away and left to uh, left up to individual medical schools to define mm -hmm. based on their own um, their own. Uh, community and the environment yep. and the population that that, that school serves. Mm -hmm. But the white people out there and the Asian people have said, well, if I'm not URM, I must be ORM. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and uh, our good friend, Dr. Sunny Nakai, um, who is uh, at a medical school in California, a, a dean at a medical school in California, mm -hmm. is very adamant. Like that just sounds like you're saying, I'm white and they're going to, they're going to, um, hold that against me <laughs> no i mean it, it's it's something that's very protective they can't 
they shouldn't be if they are going about it legally using that as an indicator for anything. And so, no, it's not going to be held against you. And yes, everybody's situations growing up are different. And so being first generation, you're having to tackle a lot of different things. Race is really not necessarily a part of that. So, um, you know, I think that's why it's probably a good thing that they open up that essay to, to give it some, some breathing room so that you can tell colleges about, um, you know, just your life experiences if you want to disclose them. So, yep. yeah, this is, I would say this is a non-issue. Yeah. Um, I will remind you too, Megana, um, and Courtney, I know you can speak to this, is with, with a COMIS, they've never had a so-called disadvantage status, but they do mm -hmm. have a background information part mm -hmm. of the application that instead of being an essay is a checkbox, yes, no. And it asks questions such as, did you attend a high school or uh, mm -hmm. where there was a majority of people on free and reduced lunch? What, um, was English not the language primarily spoken in your home? Right. Mm -hmm. So it does get at some of these things. Yeah. But again, it's not a simple toggle of disadvantaged advantage. It's just they're looking to get some context on what your circumstances were when you were growing up and getting your education. Yep. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be surprised that AMCAS potentially does something similar or individual medical schools do something similar. Um, I think most people potentially know that the Supreme Court is reviewing a case right now about affirmative action. It's probably going to go away. Uh, California schools haven't been able to use affirmative action for mm -hmm. many years, and they're still doing a great job with diversity. They, they just use other things, right? We don't need to, to know, are you black? Are you white? Are you uh, Hispanic, Latino to to put you in a bucket, we can like those questions, Rachel, you were just asking, we we know, uh, unfortunately, right, um, some very common things that would potentially um, say, yeah, this is probably someone who has some diversity um, in ethnicity, diversity in skin color, but also diversity in experiences, upbringing, socioeconomic status, all of those things that that we want at our school. I have a zip code that I can look at on the application. I can plot them out. Yeah. Yeah. So we have data. We can we can do some digging if we want to. Yeah. Yeah. We we are not a country that uh, like I think it was Finland or or the Netherlands where every single elementary school like um, public school they all get the same amount of funding. Period. No matter where they are. I'm like, oh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Some of the yeah. things that they have going on overseas are. <laughs> are pretty shiny i like them but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, well. but a novel concept yeah that education quality doesn't vary by zip code mm -hmm. yep all right hope that helps clarify magana jb nine days till my mcat Woo -hoo! Woo. and the highest i've scored is a 503 in literal mc material and out of the 10 full lengths I've taken, I don't know how much more I can improve. Is it worth pushing back with a score this low? Rachel, MCAT test prep person. Uh, uh, my first question would be, is that 503 kind of two standard deviations of your like normal 498s? And you're like, oh, I got a 503 once. Yeah. Right. What, what are your, what's your thought? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, JB, the short answer is maybe. <laughs> Right. And, and exactly like Ryan said, there's going to be a lot of follow-up questions. What was your baseline diagnostic score? How long have you been preparing? What tools have you been using to prepare? How long are you taking to review your full-length exams? My hope is that for every, you know, six and a half to eight hour practice test experience, you're then over the next week or so spending another uh, anywhere from six to maybe 16 hours reviewing the exam, going through your lessons learned, the things you got right and got wrong. Um, the number one mistake I see people make when they're plateauing like this is not doing enough test analysis. Typically when you're hanging out somewhere in the low 500s, what that most commonly means is that you have content in good shape, but you're studying, um, struggling with critical reading and problem solving. It's not always the case, but it usually indicates a deficit on one of those sides. And the way you push up into like 508, 59 north of 510 is to have both the content and the critical problem solving. Um, 
but yeah, if you started at a 477, this might be your peak, dude. And, and that's okay. People get into med school sometimes with 503. You're going to have to have a lot of killer other things. Um, but um, I, it's, it's hard to say without the context of what that 503 represents. Um, there's an article, if you Google, if you go to the Blueprint MCAT blog, there's an article that they have that's, am I ready to take the MCAT? And it goes through some more detail about how to analyze your practice test scores. I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and if you're doing a study group or have a tutor or anything, definitely confer with them. Um, more data needed, but good luck making your decision. Yeah. Adam23, should I apply to a pre-accredited medical school? Good news, nobody ever applies to pre-accredited medical schools. Pre-accredited medical schools aren't allowed to recruit students or accept students or take applications from students. Or wait till the, the, the inaugural class graduates so the, instance, uh, the institution will be accredited right away. How long does that process take? Courtney, this is just kind of some uh, naivety. How do you say that word? <laughs> um, yeah. uh, being naive around the accreditation process Adam has here, right? So uh, whether it's COCA for DO schools or the LCME for MD schools, the accreditation process is, hey, we want to file for accreditation. We, we are a new school. We're going to, we want to open up in 2024 or whatever. Uh, and then the accreditation bodies do all of their work and they put a preliminary accreditation stamp on that school, right? So mm -hmm. it's, they're not, not accredited. They're right. preliminarily accredited. Yeah. And that means the school can start recruiting. They can start taking, um, applications. They can go through and have a class. And once they graduate, then the accreditation body comes back through, looks at everything and goes, okay, now you're hopefully, um, there's, there's a school in California struggling with this. Now you're fully accredited. So should students be scared of preliminarily accredited schools? I don't think scared would be the right word. Um, there are going to be some differences. So, okay. I, I want to put this out there, like branch, if it's a new independent school or just a new location, yep. sometimes they will have to go through the full accreditation process where if they had been just labeled a branch campus, they would have yep. gotten accreditation under the main institution without any of those checks for accreditation. Yep. So it could be a good thing to have a school going through the accreditation process because I can tell you, having gone through it myself, um, they're digging into all of our files. They're checking all of our processes. They're looking at all of the SOPs, um, standard operating procedures and rubrics and grading systems and professors. And they're essentially coming once a year to do all of these things. I've, I've gone through plenty of checks where I'm sitting in meetings for that. So I think it's fairly rigorous. And, you know, if you're attending school in the U.S., you should have that faith. And generally, they have to have a trust set aside for funding in case something were to happen, you would get your money back and they could transfer you to another school. So I do think that there are things in place to remove some of that concern. I think one of the main differences that's going to come when you're looking at a newer school like this is going to be in the structure setup. So if it's a bit newer or they're having new faculty and they're kind of getting up and running or you're, you know, maybe the second or third class and they're waiting on that accreditation, they're still ironing out some of the kinks. So if you're somebody who likes to be kind of innovative and on the ground floor and likes to have a say on curriculum, how it's presented, the timeline and things like that, that could be a really good situation for you. If you're somebody who needs a lot of structure and you don't want any budging, maybe that would be a little bit more difficult. What I can say is a lot of my students really benefited from being in a newer school because they could participate in clubs and organizations and they were leaders in new charters and, and you know, able to kind of jump ahead and start new things in an area because nothing was already up and going and there weren't any, you know, rules about you had to be a third year before you could, you know, hold a leadership position in this club. So a lot of opportunities 
for those that can kind of thrive in that environment. But, you know, some nuances. But as far as being scared, I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't use that word, but I would be, you know, cautious, do your homework. But there should be things in place that, that remove a lot of the risk factor. Yeah. I, I think there's there's an assumption that like new medical schools, it's like Mad Max where it's just complete chaos and yeah. everyone's trying to figure it out. Like there are years, there, there's years and years of work that go into getting this preliminary accreditation. A lot of people that come to new schools are people who were at other schools and are taking best practices from those schools. Uh, so it's, it's, it should be fine. Um, yeah. I I've learned, uh, I won't name the school. Uh, I won't throw them under the bus. There's uh, a school somewhere that uh, recently opened a branch campus. And because of the branch campuses limitations, uh, specifically around cadaver anatomy, Mm -hmm. The original campus lost their ability to do cadaver anatomy because because it was a branch cap campus operating under the same accreditation. Mm. Every student should have the same resources under that same accreditation, apparently. Mm -hmm. And so the students at the first school lost what they had. And I was like, oh, that's 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 not fun. That's not fair. So, yeah. So anyway. those words matter. Yeah. New location, private, standalone, sister schools, branch campus, they all mean something different and they all have different accreditation uh, standards that they have to go through. Yep. Just all right. the worms for you. <laughs> Good yeah. question, Adam. Uh, Annie asks, do you have any advice on how to avoid overlaying topics in the other impactful essays versus personal statement. I want to mention my immigrant hometown culture and my personal statement, but I'm afraid of redundancy. So, uh, Annie, great question. We have a pretty solid, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, philosophy here mm -hmm. at Medical School HQ that your personal statement is why medicine, not I'm an immigrant and look at my culture. So, our advice potentially is your personal statement shouldn't doesn't need to include your immigration status, your culture, all of that stuff. And that may be the perfect spot for other impactful experiences. So, yeah, it can if you're going to put it in your personal statement, I I agree. I think it should be kind of brief. There needs to be a purpose for it just to give, you know, a hint of insight. But anything in great length or detail is probably going to be better suited for um, that other impactful essays. Yep. Personal statement is why medicine. Personal statement is not here is my life story. Stick to the prompt. Here's my life story. Here's why I'm different. Here's why you should accept me. Here's diversity, all that stuff that people want to make the personal statement into. Don't do it. <laughs> All right, some good questions today. Love it, Omar. I'm an NA, and and uh, so I'm assuming nursing assistant, probably nursing assistant. It's a yep. CNA. Okay. Uh, everybody expects me to go into nursing. How might I talk to my nurse manager about an LOR? If you would recommend that uh, and connecting uh, with physicians. Hmm. Oh. Courtney? You're in a clinical setting, so yeah. you should be able to connect with physicians. I, I think being honest and, and forthright, you know, just in exploring roles and taking next steps and things like that. I've, I've had nurses that have transitioned over into medicine. It's not a bad thing, but I think you do need to be upfront or, or honest about the path just so they know how to write the letters of recommendation. Um, so I don't get one at my school that's more targeted towards nursing. And I'm like, okay, so either this person wasn't being honest or they don't have a close relationship with this person. So I think it can be very telling. So I would just broach the topic. Yeah. Uh, sometimes when I'm up in my head, Omar, Ryan says to me, hey, what if this were easy? Yeah. Right. And like, just just jump in and have the conversation. I am a little unsettled by your everyone expects me to go into nursing. 
right? Because are you projecting and assuming that? Or do you feel like, uh oh, I've misled them and I've backed into a corner? Or I used to have nursing and now I've changed my mind, right? Because if it's the first thing, you've got some messiness to fix. If it's the second thing, then just let them know. The more I think about this, the more I think I want to be in healthcare, but this isn't the path for me. People, people are allowed to evolve. People are allowed to change their minds as they have <laughs> no. more information Stop. and experiences. It is okay. Yeah. That yeah. happens. You could have been completely dedicated to this path, learned more, be a couple years in and change your mind. That is okay. Yeah. This comes up all the time, Courtney, with, with mock interviews or, or yeah. interview prep that we do with students, uh, especially around um, kind of moral, ethical dilemmas or mm -hmm. MMI scenarios where they say something and I'm like, okay, that's, a, that's all right. But let me give you some more information that potentially adds a little bit of different sure. logic into the answer. Yeah. And then they stick with the original answer and it doesn't sound like they're super convinced. And when we, when we finish the scenario and we're just talking about it and I'm giving feedback and their answer is, well, I thought I was supposed to stick with my original answer. I'm like, that's a terrible trait to have. Why would you think that? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, especially as a doctor where new studies are being done and new scientific information is coming out, best practices yeah. are constantly changing, your hospital setting or administration may be changing, you have to be adaptable and, and just maybe your patient base is changing or what's going on. And so having new information and being able to critically think through that, I think is a good thing and, yeah. and checking in with self. And so if you, if you need somebody to condone a pivot in your path, you know, here it is, you, you can do that, but you know, just have these conversations. It's, yep. it's not uncommon. Right. Kofi boat. <laughs> what? A strong MCAT, quote, make up for a weak GPA, or do adcoms look at these metrics separately when determining if you can handle the rigor of medical school? <sighs> Rachel, Scott, uh, our, our colleague who's not on today, often talks about they show different things. The MCAT shows one thing. GPA shows something else. D dive into that a little bit more. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, Kofi, I appreciate that you at least – understood that there was an option of no, they, they, it's not going to make up that they look at these metrics separately. And, and here's why uh, your GPA shows your ability to handle sustained academic rigor semester after semester, year after year, over the course of 90 plus credits, getting mostly A's, maybe a few B's in lower grades, right? I mean, again, and we've known people who have gone to med school with W's and D's and F's in their transcript, it's possible, but showing them either throughout your entire academic history, or if you had a bad patch for a sustained credit after that bad patch, that this is the kind of student you are. You can take hard upper level sciences and get good grades and be successful. The MCAT is really a problem solving exam more than a content exam. And also, it's really just a measure of your ability to handle high pressure testing. And um, Ryan was talking about, you know, the student who doubled down in the interview. My classic, um, please don't do this to students, is the person who thinks, well, if I can get through the MCAT, then everything will be fine. Like, you get that it gets harder from here, right? Like, high pressure testing is now part of your life, right? You're going to have board exams. You're going to have shelf exams. You're going to have continuing education exams. They want to know how you do under the stress of a high pressure test. So... Uh, I mean, it certainly doesn't hurt to have a strong MCAT. I'd rather see a strong MCAT and a weak GPA than weak MCAT and weak GPA. But yeah, one does not sub in for the other. I'm trying to make a, a spreadsheet really quick to, to kind of show that I, there's, there's like a half truth to it. Yeah. Um, uh, for schools that use rubrics, yes. um, there is the potential... Let me see if I could just, I'll show this real quick. If I share my screen, um, bear with me, share screen, window, untitled 10. All right. Um, so the format of this one's a little bit off. Wait, hang on. You still got to add it. Oh, I got to add it. There yeah. we go. I hate how it doesn't automatically add. Me all too. Right. Uh, all right. So I'm just going to change that to text. I'm going to hide so, this comment so we can see more. Okay. Yeah. So. 
if if a school uses a rubric, some sort of thing that says, hey, uh, between a, a 1.0 and a 2.0, we're going to give one point. Between a 2 and a 3 GPA, we're going to give two points. And then they, they break it up like that. And then between a 472 and a 490, between a 490 and a 500, a 500 to a 510, 510 to 515, and then 515 plus, right? This is just very roughly thrown together. So if, if a student is at a 3.2, they get three points. If they're at a 509, they get three points. But a higher MCAT score gives them four points. So does that, quote unquote, make up for the lower GPA? Well, no, but kind of. Like, it's just, it's semantics, right? No, right? GPA is still very important. And MCAT is very important. But for some ad comms that use rubrics, will a higher MCAT score help? Potentially, because it may give you more points in their scoring system. So my, my stance is always a higher MCAT score always helps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, I can hear the gears in your little brains turning, I want to remind you that Ryan made an example <laughs> of a partial rubric. <laughs> Don't go making that quick spreadsheet gospel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Courtney, you want to chime in here? I'm, I'm seeing, <laughs> I'm seeing lots of thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I can see the want to chime in face. Um, no, I, I I have lots of thoughts on it. I I like that we're transparent, right? And, and yes, I think rubrics matter, um, but they're still going to be looking at the individual numbers as individual things, you know. Um, at the end result, I'm hoping that I have built my rubric in a way that those end numbers are indicative of the application, but sometimes there are nuances to it. So I'm still going to be going in and kind of taking a look at um, some of the information. So what I, what I would be able to say is if you had a lower GPA, you know, and we're looking at trends and all of those things, and then I look at your MCAT and it's very strong, then I would say, okay, the material was learned, but maybe there was something else going on. And it looks like they've been able to handle um, some of these course, lo course loads as they got further on, but they're a good test taker. So they're able to apply what they've learned, retain it, and, and do well in a standardized test format. So I do think that there's information that we do try to clean out of it, but in, in best case scenario, both matter. Um, but we're, we're generally when it's very lopsided like that, that's when we're kind of getting into the weeds to look for any indicators that can better inform us on where you are as a student now and how we think you'll perform. So, yeah. Yep, yep. I loved I loved creating rubrics, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I loved doing it and having things weighted and, and what mattered based on what I was getting, you know, to be able to quantify it. So yeah, was, I enjoyed it. It's fun. Yeah. I think the most important thing to consider about all this stuff is even with rubrics, you're never gonna see what they are. They're gonna vary school to school, they can vary year to year. And like Courtney said, there's nuances. Do not try to play a game where you are not the one who gets to set or see the rules. Just do your best in everything and apply. We have time for maybe one more. Got a few more minutes before All our right. hour's up. Charbel, hey, MAPS team or MSHQ team. <laughs> <Could Those>. you... <laughs> right Could now, you... I'm the only branded person and I've got mapped up. <laughs> yep. Could you explain a little on early decision programs? I am very confused if I should or not because of the possibility of being late in the regular cycle if EDP doesn't work. So I have a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, firm philosophy on this. For most students, early decision, there's just too much risk and not enough benefit. Um Early decision is, is one of those things where you are saying, I only want to come to your school. I'm only applying to your school. And a lot of students, Courtney, they'll, they'll try to get around this by, by going, well, 
I'm applying AMCAS early decision. So that means I can still apply to a Comus. And I'm like, no. No, what? you're signing something that says you're not doing that. To any other medical schools, period. Um, you are saying one school, I love you. Will you marry me? I, I don't yes. want to look at anyone else. Um, and those schools, they, they have some spots for early decision and they're typically looking for someone very specific at that point. I, it's just, and, and yes, this student is very aware, right? You're going to be late potentially for regular decisions. So early decision schools typically have to let you know by the end of September ish, sometimes hopefully earlier. Uh, but then, Hey, the rest of my application is going out to the rest of the schools end of September, early October, turning those secondaries around. That's a lot of work for being that late in the cycle. I don't know what your thoughts are, Courtney, on, on early decision. Did you guys have it at Burrell? So no, we didn't have it at our school, but I am very familiar with it. And I got a lot of, you know, carryover from Texas. So I, yeah. I, I know a lot about it. Um, it's very risky. I agree. I think you, if you're doing it, I would say you need to have a, a pretty solid application, yeah. notably strong and have a strong tie to the area, to the school where it's, it's kind of maybe a formality uh, of going through the process, but anything other than that, where you're, um, you know, you're looking to have a one and done cycle, you probably need a broader approach. It's, there's just some risk factor in it. Yeah. And, and I think what you just said, right. You, you, you need a strong application. I think there's a lot of misconception out there that is if I'm dedicating myself to this one school, then that means that I really want to go to them and it's okay if I have lower stats. And I'm like, no, early decision is not a shortcut for, for poor stats. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't do that. It's, it's really not because if they're, they're kind of guarding these seats, mm -hmm. they want, to see really solid students fill them that fit the mission that are maybe from the area that are that they're willing to kind of champion they've they've set those aside and then everybody else goes into a pool of we'll see in context of the rest of kind of what rolls in throughout the application cycle now that doesn't mean you know forever you'll be rejected but um they're guarded i would say there you go. I think we have time for one more. One more oh, quick one. We can do it. I have faith. Manor, do DO schools prefer DO physician letters over MD physician letters when they say highly recommended or they are accepting of both equally? Uh, Courtney, I'll throw this one back to you as well. Yeah. Again, former director of admissions at really? an osteopathic school. Um, yeah. Yeah. There, there's a lot of mis... Uh, we get this question from both yeah. sides. Hey, I'm applying to MD schools. I have a DO letter. Are they going to look poorly at me before that? Yeah. There's only one DO school that I know has a strong preference towards the, re the required. Um, and then the rest of them, I would say most will probably say recommended, um, but they absolutely accept both. And so it's really up to you. Sometimes there's just not access to having a DO that you can shadow. And sometimes you shadow a DO and you're not seeing OMM. So I think do what you can, um, you know, be able to obviously speak to the DO philosophies and the tenants and how that fits kind of your methodology. But beyond that, it, it really is open-ended. They're both physicians. Yep, yep. And with that, my friends, we have come to the close of another pre-med office hours. We are here every, almost every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we, we, I also do um, a live Q&A on Fridays at 11 a.m. Eastern. If you have questions, private questions that you want to ask the Medical School HQ advising team, we do offer one-on-one -on -one advising options over at medicalschoolhq.net. You can work directly with Courtney, myself, Dr. Wright, Rachel, um, for a 30-minute call if you have some questions. So go over to medicalschoolhq.net. And last but not least, Bernie Granham. And yes. Bernie Granham, yes. 
<laughs> don't forget about Verinia. Yeah, we uh, don't all five do all the advising, but all all five of us will do a half hour session. And then you can check the website pages to see who does what for some of the other choices. You got it. We are also putting on a workshop tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I believe that workshop is, is it two or four Eastern? I forget. Oh, it's something. Go over to premedworkshop.com. That's where you'll <laughs> find that information. It's all about building your school list. So go check that out. Good times. Yes. Oh, it says March. It's in April. It's that was April. my bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's All right. It's... All right. See you guys next time. All right. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.